one, 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 nine or seven. That has been going on unremittingly for the last four or five hours. A constant stream of numbers, data, information from mission control down on Earth to the crew up in space coming back in for these last few miles in terms of a space, space flight, the last few miles to home. This information going up all the time because the only people who have computers at their disposal to sort out all the problems, to work out all the technical difficulties, is ground control. Up there in space, Lovell and Swigert and Hayes are coming in at the moment in a command module that is apparently working as well as it should. In the last few hours, they've lived through what Apollo 13 officials at Mission Control are already calling a technical miracle. The miracle is in those numbers that you heard. Mission Control have been passing up detail after detail after detail on how to handle a situation that has never happened before in the history of spaceflight. A situation where a crew are coming back in with minimum oxygen, minimum water, practically no power left, with three parts of a spacecraft joined together in a point of the flight where no logical organizer at Mission Control would ever have them joined together. A service module which didn't work for the last two days, they've had to keep it until just a few hours ago in order to keep their trajectory stable. The lunar module should have been left on the moon and at any rate should have been left way back in lunar orbit. That lunar module has been put through the kind of test that its, that its constructors never could possibly have imagined that it would have been put through. And it's come through it with flying colors. The lunar module has saved the lives of Lovell, Swigert and Hayes by keeping them alive on its systems, on its power, on its oxygen, on its water. And as you heard Cliff say just a few minutes ago, when they said goodbye to it, they said goodbye to it with the kind of feeling that you say goodbye to somebody who saved your life. That's what the lunar module has done. The figures coming up from the vast team of 400 odd men at Mission Control has ensured that as this flight came in, crippled as it was, the crew on board had a better and better and better chance of staying alive the closer they got to Earth, the longer the systems kept working, and the more successfully each jettison, first of all of the service module three or four hours ago, and then the lunar module just a few minutes ago, each jettison went successfully. And as it went well, so their chances of survival increased. They're left now after a, a trip that has included a number of technical miracles, throwing the flight book out of the window, relying totally on the men on the ground with a computer on board that they couldn't risk using except in one or two occasions when they could risk the power. Flying in a sense blind up there, they've come to within the last few minutes of being alive and well on the surface of the earth. And they face ahead of them those last few vital tests to bring them through this mission, a mission that Mission Control in Houston must regard, as I said at the beginning and I repeat it again, a technical miracle has brought them as far as this. And if they land safely, then Mission Control can be sure that the people on the ground are the ones who have saved those in space. Cliff. We now begin to concentrate, really, on the recovery of this space capsule as it comes down. And our attention is pulled more and more to a number of diverse operations in this very complicated operation. The people who actually recover it, the aircraft people, the people who follow it in and right the way down to the Iwo Jima, which stands right in the middle of that target area. The Iwo Jima, fully loaded displacement is 18,000 tonnes, fully loaded. Uh, she draws 30 feet of water, turbine driven sing single shafts of 22,000 horsepower. She steams along there at over 30 knots. And on board her, at this moment, she's got those aircraft carriers actually waiting with the men that will go in for that rescue from the Iwo Jima. Lieutenant Jenke, you're in charge of the recovery operation from the frogman's point of view, aren't you? Yes, I am. Uh, we have three, two swim teams of three swimmers each, uh, a primary swim team and a backup swim team, and I'm the decontamination swimmer. Uh, right here we have Steve Jewett and Pete Carolyn. Uh, Pete is the uh, lead swimmer in the primary swim team, mm -hmm. and Steve is his backup swimmer. Uh, right now they're going through getting on their personal swim gear and making the gear check. And this is just for uh, safety purposes. <laughs> he has his belt on, his knife here, which we call a K-bar, on which we have a flare and a smoke. If we run into problems, run into trouble, any type of distress situation, we could uh, crack a, a orange smoke or at night use the flare. This is the standard uh, underwater demolition team life jacket we use. It's a uh, activated by a CO2 cartridge 
that size, yeah. which is screwed in here. Of course, we use the standard uh, frogman mask and fins, which are the uh, basic tools of our trade. Is there anything special about the, the bodysuit? Is it specially insulated in any way? We found that uh, working in 85 degree water temperature in the South Pacific, it gets very warm uh, working in any type of wetsuit. Uh, it was almost like working in a sauna bath. And, uh, so this time, we, we've come up with a, a lighter weight, a thinner wetsuit that we hope uh, will make things a lot cooler. I don't see anything in preparation for repelling any sharks that might turn up. No, we don't carry any, any type of uh, shark repellent. Uh, all, we haven't run into any problems with sharks. About the only thing we do and that we can do in a situation where we run into sharks is, would be to uh, get out of the water, get on the collar. Or get, or get picked up. Get picked hmm. up, yes. On the subject of the collar, this is how it goes into the water. Can we just, uh, can we just take a look Excuse here? Excuse me, fellas. Fellas, you want to come over here and uh, start deploying this collar here? Pull it a out. flotation collar goes into the water like that. Okay, yes. This, it goes in just like it is now in this package. Once we get it into the water, the swimmers swim it up to the spacecraft. Mm -hmm. Start unpacking it. Now, it, th th all this stuff that's going on at the moment happens in the water. Is this, that right? this all occurs in the water. And three men do it. Pete, want to move over here another way? The first thing around the spacecraft is what we call a bungee cord. This thing here. Right. You see, this. Steve and Roger now are pulling out this elastic cord, yeah. stretchable. And this uh -huh. initially around the spacecraft and yeah. it's hooked in on a D ring right underneath the hatch, which is in front. Next, we pull around the flotation collar itself, which is pulled all the way around the spacecraft and hooked up again under the hatch. This is all, all occurs in the water. Now, where are you while this is going on? I'm still in the uh, recovery helicopter, uh. and waiting for the collar to be installed and inflated and for the rafts to be set up. After the collar has been completely attached to the spacecraft, it is inflated. Now, we use... Uh, Two CO2 bottles. In there, yeah. I you see. have one right here. To get that around oh, here, you get a shot of that. Okay. Yeah. Here's one CO2 bottle, and there's another one over here. We use one of these CO2 bottles, or the primary bottle, to inflate the collar. The second CO2 bottle is a backup bottle. In case you know, this one goes wrong. What's the fastest in your practices, or in the real thing, because you've done recovery before, that you've had this thing deployed and on the spacecraft? I think our fastest time is about seven minutes, and that was... Uh, really moving along. It's a cruel paradox, perhaps, that the nearer they come to the safety of the Earth, the nearer, too, comes the moment of perhaps the greatest danger, the moment when their fragile capsule must plunge safely through the atmosphere to splash down in the Pacific.